Hey, good evening, everyone, and welcome to a Spoke a Gallery. Uh, my name is Michael Dowling, and I am the founder and the artistic director of Spoke, formerly known as Medicine Mill Productions. Um, I am, I knew very early on in life that I was an artist. I think when I was about seven years old, I proclaimed that I was an artist. And I did a beautiful um, drawing of a checkerboard floor that had these Irish Celtic designs on them. And I didn't even know what Irish Celtic designs were, but I, I was sort of drawn to these shapes. And I came home from school and my next door neighbor saw my drawing. And she loved it. And she said, oh, I wish I had wallpaper that looked like that. And I remember as a little boy going home with huge sheets of paper trying to make wallpaper for the next door neighbor. <laughs> so, but it was, for me, it was a, a, an enormous affirmation of who I was. And, and I was seen by this person. And so the power of art early on in my life had an impact on somebody else, my next door neighbor. Um, unfortunately for me, by the time I was in the third grade, uh, something happened that, that sort of changed the course of my artistic career. And we had a teacher who was uh, instructing us how to draw the perfect tree. And she was at the chalkboard, and there were six steps, and she was outlining them. And it was a beautiful fall day, probably just about this time of year in New England. There were giant sugar maples and Norway maples right outside the window. And some, I think this crew here is old enough to remember the big fat crayons that we had uh, in grammar <laughs> school. And I was drawing with both hands with my red and orange and yellow and looking out the windows. And the teacher held my drawing up at the end of the class. And she says, you know, this is the worst tree I've ever seen a child draw. <laughs> and of course, what she meant was, does not follow directions, right. right? And, you know, I took that, my mother picked me up from school that day and there was a little girl, my sister, my younger sister and her best friend across the street was, were in the back seat. And the little girl loved my drawing. So I gave it to her, I said, here, right? So she took my drawing and I, the sat, two things happened that day. One, I gave my identity away. And two, I took on a new identity because I went home and I practiced the six steps of the perfect tree and I did it better than anyone else. So for many years then, I was kind of an imposter and I had really given away the vision for my work. And it was a long, long journey uh, back to that awareness. But when I was 37 years old, and I'm gonna shut up after this, I had a vision and I had a vision of that checkerboard drawing that was floating on the water. I decided that I was going to build a floating floor. And so uh, every day for a year, I would draw these Celtic designs that were coming to me in dreams. And I installed in 1998, installed this uh, show called Freshwater at the Danforth Museum in Framingham. And I went with my mother to the south of France. And we went to the shrine at Lord. And we took water from the Shrine of Lord to bring back because I had built in the center of this floating floor a little well house that had my grandmother's bucket. And she was the keeper of the sacred well in Ireland. And we filled it with this water from Lord. Right? And, the, and all of a sudden, everything made sense to me. The teacher in the third grade, her name was Sister Mary Bernadette de Lord. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so there are no coincidences in life. And, uh, and so it is, you know, that journey uh, to recognition and, and losing myself and then reconnecting to myself and then, uh, you know, becoming the artist who, um, who I am today and, and being blessed that I'm able to do work that many uh, next door neighbors have uh, found some meaning in. And tonight we have three like really incredible artists all with powerful, powerful stories of personal identity and cultural identity. And they bring you know, their, their lens as an artist to their work. 
And, you know, so all of us have stories. I have my story, which I just told you part of my story. And, you know, I'm looking around now at this group and the group of artists are all in their 50s, youngsters. Uh, and, you know, we have our story now as a group. And the power of these three artists is to connect the rest of us to the story, the story of our existence, the meaning of our lives. And so it is really with you know, the deepest, deepest joy that um, I welcome these artists to spoke in one of our, I think this is the third or the fourth of our bespoke uh, gallery talks. And, and special thanks to Kathleen Petetti, our curator, Greg Liakis, who's our executive director who I see on Zoom, Richie, our technician tonight, Susan Krause, our director of development, Charles Morrell, teaching artist. Beverly Sky just walked in. He's been a visiting artist here in the last couple of weeks. So, um, but anyway, I'm gonna let the artists very briefly uh, introduce themselves. And I'm gonna ask them each, um, you know, when did they, when did they realize they were called to be artists? So we'll start with John. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Shay, um, for your work. Uh, thank you, everyone here. Uh, all that you are, all that you do, and all that you're becoming. I, I grew up a few blocks away from here, and unlike Michael, I never made a pronouncement that I was an artist because it wasn't anything in my experience. I didn't know what an artist was, although I was creating all the time as a child. What an artist was wasn't something in my experience. What I wanted to be was an athlete because I saw that as something that was respected, something that was protected, um, something that was, and when I say protected, I think if you were talking about losing, you know, giving up part of who you are, I think that happens with different experiences, but also when people are in sort of a, a, a survival mode. So I think as a kid that to me being an artist was opening myself up as a target, which I think if you look at a lot of young people today, what you might see is obnoxious or, or loud or there's really ways of them protecting themselves. So I played football, baseball, or basketball, but I wasn't really good at any of that. And then I would come home and, and create for hours and hours and hours. But I didn't make the connection that that's who I was. And it was really the only time where I felt comfortable in my own skin. The rest of the time, it was just a visceral, reaction to the, to the world around me. And I just felt like I just would feel too much of uh, everything was too much. Being around people was too much or uh, intense. I won't say too much, but intense. One thing I wrote down was window shades. We grew up in a triple decker where my grandfather and his brother were on the first floor. We were on the second floor and my aunt and her children on the third floor. In not knowing what an artist was, I was looking around and I thought window shades. I saw a painting and I saw the texture in the, the weave of the fabric. And then I looked at the vinyl window shade of my grandfather's house. And I thought that's what artists paint on. And completely naive. In the, in, in, in as be, as be, uh, embarrassing as that power story is, which you know I embrace now. Um, the great part was that my grandfather and his brother let me take the shades off their windows mm. and paint on them. Now, so that was my earliest, my earliest memory of, of being an artist. Okay, thank you. Hi, my name is Peggy Woods Darby, and I am the owner and operator of the Woods School of Irish Dance. Here in South Boston, I've been teaching almost 27 years here in South Boston. But my story is quite different because um, I still don't consider myself an artist. I was 
I was, um, my mom sent me into less Irish dance lessons when I was about five years old. Loved Irish dancing, competed all over the place, competed at the world, competed in like all these other states. And I don't know, I always just, I was a good dancer and I won. And I just loved Irish dancing, loved it, never thought anything of it, you know? And when I left dancing at, I think around 15 years old, people would come up and say, um, you're gonna open your own school, you're gonna open your own school. And I'm like, no, no. Like I, I didn't know how to teach, but I didn't know I knew how to dance. So two years later, people just kept asking and asking. So I ended up just saying, all right, I'll open a school. I opened a school up at uh actually where I'm teaching now, the Perkins Post. And I legit was teaching the kids bluebird, bluebird bird through my window, because I didn't know how to teach Irish dancing, but I knew how to dance. So it took me a long time to figure it out. I had to have people come over from Ireland to kind of help me teach. So anyway, now that I've been teaching and I now have my own students who have gone to the worlds and have gone to nationals and have gone and competed in top 10 in the, uh, in the nation, I, um, I don't know, I still like, I, I was introduced to Shay. Shay introduced himself and he said, uh, he goes, oh, what is your art? And I was like, I'm not an artist. Mm -hmm. and, and I said, no, I just dance. And he said, dance is art. Mm -hmm. so, in which I know that it is. I but... I said was, how are you doing? <laughs> 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 anyway, and I, um, I don't know, I guess I, it's something that I truly, truly, truly am blessed to be able to do. And um, I just love every minute of it that it doesn't even feel like work. And mm. it's just something that I, I come home still and I say, oh my God, I love my job. I, I just I just love what I do. So mm. that's my story. Mm. When did I know I was, I guess I'm next, okay. When did I know I was an artist? Um, I gotta really think back. When I was in kindergarten, I remember um, I had two teachers, Mrs. Egan and Mrs. McDonough, who set up this giant aluminum foil um, thing that was supposed to represent the ocean and all the kids were supposed to look through books. And so it's like one of these childhood yeah. stories, look through these books and come up with creatures that live in the ocean, mm -hmm. right? So obviously I wasn't listening at the time, so I'm doing everything. And so once it's all put up, you see like shark, starfish, um, sharks, mm -hmm. whales, all these different things. And you see this massive koala bear on the end. <laughs> and I'll never forget this girl, Maureen Rivera, looking at it and saying, koala bears don't live in the ocean. And I was teared up. And one of the teachers said to me, it just means that you're, you're creative. And it means you look at things differently. There's nothing wrong with that. And I was like, yeah, it's my koala bear. <laughs> um, when I was really young, every Saturday morning, there was a TV show that came on called Drawing from Nature with Captain Bob Cotton. Mm. Everybody, yep, oh, I love that show. Oh, yeah. it, he was Bob Ross before it was Bob yeah, right. Ross. Yeah. Say, okay, boys and girls, let's draw the horseshoe yeah. crab. Yeah. Right. And you have a big yeah. board there. Well, I used to spend some weekends at my Aunt Jane's house. Love my Aunt Jane to death because she's always encouraged me to be an artist. She's like a second mother to me. She's my mom's sister. Um, so I would do a lot of the drawings and follow them. And at the end of each episode, he would post, he would pan across the, um, come on in. He would pan across the um, screen, pictures that were sent in from your viewers. Mm -hmm. At the end of the show, he'd say, oh, send it in. I'm like five years old and I see one of mine on there. Mm -hmm. And I'm so excited. I'm like, oh my God, I gotta tell my mother now. But it's like 5.30 in the morning. I had one of mine too. There you go. <laughs> of course, the problem is they hadn't invented the VCR yet, so I couldn't <laughs> take it. But I'll never forget going, that's mine on the screen, freaking out. And um, I had an upstairs neighbor named Wendell Sullivan, who um, when we were kids, we always used to trade uh, drawings of superheroes and comic books and things like that. He was just an amazing artist. He was a few years older than me. And I loved his drawings so much. And when he gave me a few, I would start copying them and looking at the comics and realize that mines were just as good or better in some ways and stuff like that. And it inspired me. So for the longest time, I wanted to get into 
superheroes, illustrations, comics, things like that until um, when I got to college, BU, and I started taking classes in women's studies or African American history and literature. Then, you know, Batman started turning into a rich white guy in tights who was just beating the hell out of people who had mental illnesses versus <laughs> what it was before. It started being less and less. And I was like, well, Paul Robeson was a superhero. Josephine Baker was a superhero. And these are real life people, you know? And so I started saying, let me start putting value into the people who are actually real, whose stories might be ignored at times. And that's been the trajectory I've been on ever since in terms of my focus, my emphasis, and things like that. So that's how I started. That's fantastic. That's my second question. Start with <laughs> <laughs> well, you've already started it. You know, I think, you know, at some point, of course, um, you know, our cultural identity starts to inform, you know, what we do as artists, right? And so, and, you know, so what, you know, so what is it about the, the call of your cultural identity um, that drives your work? It's a very broad question because I think, you know, here we are a culture of creative people, right? We're a group of creative people, right? And probably we have a lot in common. Uh, but, you know, when you look at Shea's work, there is a lot of, uh, there's a lot of history in this work, a lot of cultural context. If you look at Peggy's dancing, there's a lot of cultural context, right? If you look at John's work and, you know, John did a lot of this work in Italy, right? And there's a very cultural, very spiritual context, right? So each of you kind of come to it through another cultural lens. So what would you say was your biggest cultural lens uh, in your work? Well, mine was my Irish grandfather. You know, I know that. And everything that I did would involve, you know, very elemental things like water, earth, fire, and air. Right? Just the elements of creation. You know, as I was saying, she kept a sacred well, and I learned to carry water as a way of life, right? It was in everything I did, all my work was really focused around what I learned culturally from that cultural identity and that heritage and that history. And some of it was just passed down, and I wasn't even aware that it was being passed down, right? So you, I, I was inheriting a culture by birth, by ancestry, by all of these uh, forces that were bigger than maybe my personal identity mm -hmm. and what I might have been drawn to. So that's exactly my story. <laughs> it's the same, you know, cultural, uh, I mean, Irish grandparents and, um, you know, they emigrated to uh, New York and um, I don't know, raised their kids here in Boston. And my mom wanted to keep the tradition alive put us in, well, put me in Irish dancing for I don't know what reason. My, my grandmother never danced, my mom never danced. And I think they just, you know, wanted to keep the Irish tradition and the heritage alive. You know, one thing, when we went to Italy, it, I, I thought back, you know, I was thinking I was gonna go and, and, and be embraced by, <laughs> you know, the, my ancestors. And they were like, no, nah, you, you, you're American. You know, and then I remember the nuns being upset that I didn't speak the language. And I thought, like, why, why don't I? And I thought back to my, my uh, Sicilian grandparents, uh, my mom's side is Irish, and how really, and again, it's similar to what you were saying about um, giving up parts of your identity um, and how it was like, no, we're not, we're not speaking the language. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're here now. We're, we're going to, we're going to try and fit in. We're going to lose ourselves. We're going to give up parts of ourselves to try and quote unquote, fit in a certain way. So I think part of that um, formed, you know, helped you know, informed me as, as an artist, but also for me, it was very much, um, my experience with the world, I think, in, in uh, being in school uh, and then in, in, in later on, uh, and it's been for me very, very gradual, you know, thinking about how it connects, not 
you know, in a literal way, but in a, uh, I don't have the words for it, but how it, it feels in, in my senses. But finding that connection through family. I think family was, my family was one of the most important things to me always. And I know when I went to, to BU, I, I had hate, I never liked school. And I think it was just the, the uh, just again, uncomfortable being around people and the, the whole, I just never felt comfortable. But when I went to BU, I studied with uh, John Wilson, uh, a Boston sculptor. And I remember being there and a lot of the students were from New York or the West Coast or some international students. I was one of a few students from around here. And I was planning on doing something quote unquote practical. Like I'm gonna try to get a skill and get a job. But I studied with John Wilson and he changed everything for me and how I saw art. It was really for the first time where he, I mean, he was someone that, and we became friends and I worked in his studio. But the way he spoke about art, I really connected with him. Um, I mean, he spoke about the, not the way things looked, but the, the inner life, you know, the, the, the core of things. And I think that to me is still with me. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm answering the, answering the question. practically feel like I'm listening to a soulmate. Um, I went to Boston University, um, as you as well, and I was a humongous John Wilson fan. As a matter of fact, his statue, uh, Total <coughs> Presence, at the Museum of African American History, uh, every year since my son was born on his birthday, I always bring him there and take a photo of him until he turned 18. I love that statue. I've been such a huge fan. So when you say that, I'm like, oh my God, yes, John Wilson. Um, I was so blessed and lucky to have met him a number of times before he passed and talked to his wife. Mm -hmm. and just so inspirational. Mm -hmm. So I got to give it to you. That's me, you can make some, some, some help you make some connections. I've got some, I got some pictures. I was working in his school. I said, I knocked on the door and I said, I, I just want to be around you. I'll do anything. I'll clean it. You know, so I was in the studio. I have pictures of that sculpture that you're talking about mm -hmm. in process from, wow. from the armature. Mm -hmm. So let's share those with you. Love to see it. In answer to your question uh, regarding the cultural aspect that relates, um, I come from an African American family that orig originated from Richmond, Virginia, and Harrisonburg, Virginia. Uh, many of us still live there, but a number of us live in Connecticut. Just a couple of us live in Massachusetts. Uh, one of the things that's always been there for me is I've always had encouragement, but I've also always received things visually, particularly my grandparents' house, as I mentioned in my last mm -hmm. talk, or certain things certain uncles did or relatives did that inspired me. So when my uncle Gene had a fish fry and all the family got together for a reunion, or there was a, a, some of my uncles, like my uncle Earl, or my uncle, um, Rodney or my uncle uh, Nelson had racing cars and stuff in the 70s and stuff. Got me into Evil Knievel stunts, cool stuff you can do, and it just got me into a creative process about things. But one of the things that I've always kept in the back of my mind is don't ever sacrifice or, or put aside who I am as a black man. Uh, there's too many stories to be told, told, and I think I came that from my experience at Boston University and learning under Floyd Barber. He taught Afro-American mm. history and literature. Mm. And there were so many stories to be told and so many things to be said that learning those stories, those finding out these experiences and these realities of these people um, who lived during this era, who lived hundreds of years ago, even thousands of years ago, when are, when are people gonna know about and so for me, it's always about the big picture. You can even see it in my work, the big picture. Um, telling those stories and keeping those stories alive. Mm -hmm. And thanking the people in my journey, my grandmother, my grandfather, my mom, my dad, my Aunt Jane, my different relatives, 
in my family, friends of mine who have just encouraged it that, again, I look at the big picture. So culturally, that's always been there for me. Uh, the encouragement, especially. So, so we're still and going in the direction. Wow. So I also went to be you. Oh, oh yes. <laughs> and I didn't go to college. And I also studied with John Wilson. And then I was uh, blessed to teach at BU in the 80s. And he and I shared the uh, sophomore class, the drawing classes. I taught half of the students and he taught the other half in 1982, 83, 84. Yeah, so a little before your time. <laughs> But uh, he was a man who had a capacity to see into the student's soul. And, you know, he would look at you and pull out of you something that was pure magic, right? And, you know, his work was powerful and figurative, right? But he saw something else, the hidden, deeper, meaning that of life that is revealed through art. And, you know, Shay, you and I, when we meet, not enough, talk about the big picture, right? And how we, I always talk about art as a threshold to the big picture. So this is a two-part question. Other than John Wilson, right? We've talked about other people. Well, you know, I, it, my time at BU was really uh, astounding as well. I also was able to study with Philip Gustin, who's mm -hmm. also one of those people as a teacher. Right? But, um, but thank you, John. <laughs> um, we ran into a character out in Medfield who was, uh, who was working to preserve uh, um, John Wilson's sculpture in Brookline. Mm -hmm. right? And he was building a new platform for it and raising money for that. At yeah, City Hall. Yeah, right. Yeah, which is extraordinary. We just mm -hmm. met him a few weeks ago, right? Mm -hmm. So John Wilson's spirit is in the air, right? Mm -hmm. And I think in his work is about bringing spirit into the air, right? The spirit of time and place, right? That helps us locate ourselves in relationship to each other. Right? And each of you, you know, the joy of, you know, I had two great uncles who were Irish step dancers. They belonged to the circus in Ireland. <laughs> and they'd go around the country. The joy of, I, I was the only one in my family who didn't do Irish stuff. Because oh. I was a klutz, but I could draw. So, um, but um, who in your life perhaps was another guide for you in your work? Like, the question that I want to get to is, you know, how do you see your work as an aperture into the deeper meaning or the big picture? How does your work take us from what might be the literal dance or the narration or the physicality, the expression of the paint to this other place? And what is that place for you? Again, you brought up Gustav. For me, when he talks about art as an experience, I think when I was younger in, in drawing, whether it was from comics or Captain Bob, or you know, <laughs> just it was the mag it was something magical about what was uh, I was drawn to it. Not only did I feel free from everything else that um, that seemed difficult, but um, it was. In the beginning, the, the magic of making something look like it's it's coming off the page, you know, and then, and I remember being at the, uh, and I didn't know, so it's that experience, you know, at the same time uh, that was happening, uh, I remember middle school, I went to the McCormick Middle School, and it was the first time I had an art teacher. And then there was, this was in the mid late 70s, like desegregation and it was violence. It was a heightened atmosphere, much like it is now. It was very heightened. And so honestly, it was, I was terrified in, in a lot of ways. It was again, survival mode. 
but the art teacher singled me out and she said, there's going to be an art show uh, at the, uh, I think it might have been City Hall, uh, and would you like to paint a picture of the school? I'm going to have all the pictures of all the BPS schools and they're going to hang them up. Like, all right. So I remember taking me outside, setting up an easel. I don't know how long it took, but I think that right at that moment, I connected art with freedom. Like I got to escape school. I got out of, to get out of, you know, eighth grade and be outside. And I remember just being so peaceful and Mrs. Scott would just stand there by my side. And I did this painting. I didn't know what I was doing, or, but it, again, it was that experience. In, in the classroom, there was a poster of a painting on the wall. And again, I was always feeling anxious about wanting to get out. Like, I need to get out of here. I want to get out. I want to get out. And I was looking at the painting, and it was the first time I thought, I, I wasn't looking at the painting. I was thinking, I felt like I know, I think I know what that person was thinking when they made that, I was thinking of the artist. And, and again, it could explain it. Like I said, like, I don't want to explain it. It was like that magic sort of quality. But the painting that was there, um, and that experience, 35 years later, uh, one of my uncles, Bobby Mullen, got off the bus, the City Point bus, went into the adult ed school and started taking painting classes. Wow. And so he's doing all these paintings. He, he was in his 70s at the time, and he started painting. So we would connect. He's like, I want to go painting. I love it. <laughs> and so we had, I went over to have tea with them over in um, uh, where he was. He was in uh, Veterans Housing in Chelsea. <clears throat> and we were having tea, and there were so many paintings on the wall. You, just just absorbed them like a mass. But at one point I looked up. Now this is 35 years later after being at the McCormick on the wall and the same painting of the poster that was in the classroom was <laughs> on the wall that oh he did God. a copy of. Wow. And it was yeah. so so when I say in experience, like that's how art has always been for me. It's been this magical experience, you know, this transformative. You know, I think. At the same time that was happening, I started having um, seizures around 10 years old. And so I think that contributed to my, my sort of the way I was relating to the world. And I remember being petrified at that point where I'd go unconscious, but it was like this idea of traveling, right? To a, a, a different realm. And I think that's my work now, you know, has come, it's that sort of experience of that's more of the magic of it now for me that started back at that early age. So you want to talk about specific people? Yeah, your grandmother, your grandfather. Um, for your cousins. I got quite a few. <laughs> quite a few wonderful awesome cousins. Um, if I were to talk about influences, um, I got to first off say Dana Chandler, his murals up and down Roxbury got me into art. Seeing those murals were just wonderful. Dudley Station, Will mm -hmm. Hall. I was blessed and lucky enough to have met him and become friends with him years later. And he grandfathered me into the AMARC program at Northeastern University. Mm -hmm. So it is an honor to mm -hmm. say uh, Dana Chandler. Obviously, Paul Goodnight as well. Um, I take classes with him. He's like mm -hmm. a mentor to me. Wonderful artist. I've been friends with him for <clears> many <throat> years. I could talk about people you may not know who are just as important and just as valid. Barrington Edwards is a wonderful artist. Uh, everyone's giving hands up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Quest Burns, Daryl Ann McCullough, some of the mm -hmm. artists that were here before. Um, Equa Holmes. You know, let's say, you know, like, there you go, drop some names and everyone goes, yeah, you know what I'm talking That's about? Right. Um, we can talk about pro-black Rob Gibbs, who's decorating Boston like it's no one's business with his wonderful work. Um, Rob Stahl, if you like comic books, he's been a wonderful anchor and illustrator for years. He's also contributed. And the thing for me, I'm, I'm always giddy about is when I see some of their work, 
like for instance at the Basquiat exhibit at the MFA. I'm like, I know folks that have shows here. Equa Holmes has her children's illustrations here and all that. And it's just nothing but pride and support. Mm -hmm. um, Paul Gould is a wonderful friend of mine who also does illustration. It's not as well known, but I know him and he's an inspiration to me. Um, uh, Gary Logan is a guy I went to Boston University with, and he does work dealing with the environment and stuff like that, abstract work. And I wanted to say his name just in case people are watching this. They said, let me look up Gary Logan. Oh, oh it's just wonderful. Um, so I've gained a lot of friends and met a lot of people that I'm just inspired by, period. And I'm like, oh, you just make me want to go back to the studio and do some stuff. In addition to family members and friends, um, who I've had con casual conversations with over the years or relationships with in different ways, whether they're students of mine, like a Dayton Jackson or a friend of mine who ran a camp like a Susan Yuzinski. Then I'm like, oh, you know, then when I get back, I'm going to do some stuff. Yeah. So it's like, you know, people who don't particularly do drawing or painting, but inspire me to do the things I do. Um, so the list can get longer and longer and longer and longer, but I don't want to take the time to answer well, the question. You can because mine, I never had an aha, like I'm just going to say the same thing. I never had an aha moment or an event. It was just my mom sent me to dancing, and I guess she's the one that she's, she's the one that started this all. And we had just a, a very tight family. My grandmother, my mom was a twin. Eight brothers and sisters, they were all involved in Irish events, going down to Cape Cod to the Irish village. And it was just family. I don't have anyone maybe on the outside that, you know, influenced me more than my family, I guess, the Irish dancing. So mine is just, I don't even know <laughs> for it. Yeah, I think, you know, Peggy, one of the things that uh, has really struck me by things that everyone has said, but is, well, you know, I could dance. Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. I could dance. Right, that acknowledgement. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think my last. Oh, I have two. How are we doing on time, Rachel? I have a way of going on. I don't know. Twelve minutes. Twelve minutes. <laughs> I have two two questions, but um, they're they're very different from one from the other. One is um, how do you feel when you're creating? What does it feel like? Like I said, I go home every day and say, I'm so happy. I love what I do. But it's, it's nothing that you could ever imagine when you're teaching these little, little, little girls and boys and they, they just love me. <laughs> <laughs> they love me. They just, they hug me and Miss Peggy, Miss Peggy. And oh God, I just love it. All right. You said something earlier too that really struck me. I can't, I'm going to say it again. I could dance. You know, it was as natural to you to dance yes, as to breathe. Oh, right? 100%. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I think, you know, yeah. I, I don't know. It's like, I, like I said, I never thought it was anything. Like, people, I would have like big, huge trophies, and, you know, people were all, like always competitive. And I just, I just walked out there like, you ready? She was known for her shop kicks. I knew I was just, I, I wasn't like, a, I wasn't conceited. I, I didn't even know I was good to, to anybody else, but inside I knew I was good. And mm -hmm. when I would go out there, I would perform. I wasn't in for a competition or I didn't I'd like win or, but I would always win. And then I would just put the, the, the award aside and get out of my uniform or costume and just be a regular kid. So. I think that's a common thread in the story. Natural is breathing to create. So Shay, how does it feel to create? Um, many times it feels good. Um, I have moments when I'm angry because some of the information I'm putting together or reading, I get like, I feel like, I don't know, you know, Woodward and Bernstein or some of these other people feel like when they expose certain things, but when you do the research and you find things out, you get mad. You say, I'm gonna tell, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say something about this. Um, I could I try to be inspired in terms of the choice of the medium I use, in terms of the materials I use. Um, I feel good about myself. 
Um, some days it feels like work, some days it can feel depressing, especially since January 6th. But there's always been something that stayed in the back of my mind. When I was in high school, um, every morning, and this was when I was at English High, we had a morning announcement by the principal of the school. And he would talk a little bit about what activities are gonna happen and things like that. And at the end of his announcements, he always said, and this was it, Sid Smith who was our principal. No matter where you go or what you do, go with pride, go with respect. When it's Diaz, gonna be LaSalle, the J.P. Priest, we just say good morning in different languages. But no matter where you go and what you do, go with pride and go with respect. And so ever since those days in English high, when I'm doing stuff, I just know I'm doing the best that I can. And I'm trying to create the best that I can. And that always stays in the back of my mind. I feel at home with myself. I feel at home. Um, and again, it's the it's the time where and I would agree with you that uh, it's not always, you know, uh, the times where you feel just just the release, you know. I, yeah, I feel at home. At home. Mm -hmm. Nice. This is my last question because I know you're all about the same age. And I know that you all went to school uh, in Boston during a very turbulent time. And, you know, in turbulent times, still or again, or you want to look at that. And how do you think, or do you think, being an artist, what is the role of the artist in turbulent times? Me? I think there's always, always going to be a place for the artist. Uh, I was bothered when Donald Trump first got into office and there was a group of artists who were ready to threaten, to try to create a movement, to threaten to not do art until he did policies that were progressive and all. And I was just like, you think Donald Trump cares if you don't make a picture? <laughs> it sounded so absurd. Even in the times of complacency, even in the times where everyone was feeling good, every time, you know, or even in times of war, the poets, the writers, the artists, Let's face it, we're going to tell the truth far more than the politicians, the spin doctors, and the major mainstream networks and the talking bobbleheads will. We just always will. It just is what it is. So in that sense, truth telling is essential to any society. And you already know the society is crumbling and heading into dictatorship when they come after us. And then they come after you all for appreciating what we do. That's when you know, okay, the society's got to fall apart because now they start to target those who are telling the truth whether it's creative a painting, a poem, a dance, a song. <clears throat> so I think we're essential. Well said. I think, I think it's, it's the, um, whether it's dance, you know, reacting to the world around you when you're creating. And again, everyone has a role, but I think the artist's role is that, with that, that link of common humanity, right? With all the things that are, out there as we started this talk with of things that are trying to pull us away from ourselves. There are the, and that's where we are in trouble, the things that try to pull us away from who we are authentically. And I think our, it's the artist's role that we are connected to that and bringing and showing that and that it is beyond Beyond words. It's in the dance. Yes. Yeah. And then mine is um, I don't know. I go into I go into the class every day with love and I try to pass on that love of dance to the kids, but it also, you know, the the hugs and the kisses and the joy. And so I feel like I'm taking the kids away from what's going on on the outside when they're inside of the studio, they, they have a love and happiness. And I think it, it takes away from maybe any tense mm -hmm. situations they're in or whatever. In, you gave away our age, but from the time <laughs> I can remember, I heard of 
Peggy Woods Dance Studio. So those children that are coming to the classroom, you understand that that has been going on for decades. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the amount, the, the reach, and the amount of lives that have been touched. No, and, and I'm getting invited to, I actually am teaching now my first students' children. So it's like a big circle of, as I call it, happiness. Yes. Thanks, John. Thanks. You know, I had a student a few years ago, and I had her grandfather as a student. <laughs> <laughs> and she was 19. <laughs> okay, so we have just a, maybe one or two questions, right? Um, so Richie, why don't you open up the, uh, the screen so that we can see people. Or you can take questions in the chat. Whoever you want to do it, Richard. Or from the crowd. Yeah, I think have a question. Um, I think history, whether it be like as a cultural piece or an explicit piece, is a part of all of you all's work. Um, can you talk about a little bit just about maybe like a secret story or history that was around here in Boston in the 60s and 70s that you can remember? That maybe was reflected in your work, or that you can't talk about in your work. Sure, <laughs> I can. Right. I uh, I've lived in South Boston for forty four years. I, I moved here when I was twenty three. I moved in with my boyfriend in a neighborhood that was known to be maybe racist, maybe homophobic. Right. And I immediately decided that I hated my neighborhood. I lived in John Provenzano's uncle's house, <laughs> right? Just a couple blocks away from Wood Studio. Um, and it was, uh, uh, it was $70 a month for rent, right? And it was like really crazy. And then uh, my partner and I moved around the corner. We bought a house in 1984 for $60,000, $60, right? And people started, who were going to the high school, and what was what black kids, Asian kids, white kids, and Latino kids shared in the early 80s was the use of the word faggot. They were all very comfortable calling me a faggot. Right? And so I really started to hate South Boston even more. And then in 1992, there was a group called Gay, Lesbian, Irish Sexual. Pride Committee. They wanted to march in the St. Patrick's Day Parade. And I decided I would give out pink roses to them as they went by my house. And the parade stalled in front of my house and I handed out roses, 50 roses. And um, the next day, it was in a very exhilarating moment, right? It was like a slow motion part of the movie, but time it was like moving slowly. There was no sound and the crowd was roaring, right? They were roaring, fag, fag, but I couldn't hear anything, <laughs> right? And the next day, every window in my house was broken, right? And that day, I wrote a letter to my neighbors saying that I had lived there for a long time, that I needed their help. In that day, I joined my community, and I realized that the hatred that I carried to my community was stronger than anything they actually thought about me. And that by hating them, I was denying them access to the gift that I had to give them, which was to be an artist here in South Boston. Right? And two years later, when suicide and heroin hit our young people, uh, the young people came to me to facilitate uh, our work behind the high school. And they started to create no man's there. So for me, when I made a very conscious decision, Charles, to stop hating and to give the gift of who I am to my community, something really shifted. And I was born and raised in South Boston. So I was part of everything that he talked about growing up here. You know, remember, you know, saying fag and, you know, just going through all that stuff because you're kind of brought up and that's what you do when you're part of a group and you don't know your own choices. And but I just, in the end, find that, you know, everything changes and, you know, people open up their hearts and their homes and, you know, the hate 
I hate those. Any questions in the chat? All right, so for, for Shay, um, you've drawn, it's from Paul Gold. You've drawn a Mason, you, wait, you've drawn a Mason, who's who of individuals, from politicians to actors, comic book characters, elite athletes, etc. throughout the scroll. Who are some of the people and characters you've enjoyed drawing the most? Believe it or not, it's from Paul Gould. Yeah. yeah. One of the great artists I've been trying to do. Friends with him for like 20 years, 20 something years. He's a wonderful, wonderful illustrator. Um, believe it or not, I thoroughly enjoy drawing Vice President Nick Cheney. Uh, I've drawn him a number of times on there. I've drawn him with his heart being torn out of his chest and doing an examination of what all of the blood vessels and the corpuscles of his heart are doing and why they pump such hatred into the environment and into the military industrial complex and the damage to this country. So a good chunk of my work are these drawings and illustrations of Vice President Cheney. Plus he's easy to draw. Um, all hate knows it, but it is just look, yeah. Um, President Barack Obama, I've drawn him a number of times. Dr. Martin Luther King, I've drawn a number of times. Frederick Douglass. In terms of, um, those folks are the ones who I've enjoyed drawing the most, but to be honest with you, I haven't said they were my favorites. It's just out of habit because of the time period of the stuff that I was writing and drawing. But if I were to really clarify it, I'd say, um, I enjoy drawing people who were past presidents of the United States, particularly uh, Lyndon Baines Johnson, Harry Truman, or some of the other presidents that I've drawn in the past. Because I think on the when it's in the display case, I've pretty much drawn every single president that's ever been the president of the United States. Uh, another question for Shay. Um, <laughs> what parts of the scroll were most difficult to draw and why? Parts of the scroll that were the most difficult to draw and why? There were never parts that were difficult as much as it was to center myself when I was writing down and do a fact checking myself before I start putting information and writing information and trying not to have the scroll have the usage of profanity in mind. Because there were some things that happened that just made me want to write motherfucker or ask it and just who would want to see it if it was all on display? Mm. It's like that's just a lot of swearing. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, it devalues it on <laughs> Well, there's some facts. There's some facts. <laughs> we do, there's some facts. <laughs> but it's not going to be so big that people look and go, wow, these, these really angry. Look at some of this stuff. Because I'm not angry all the time. But obviously, it could be a reflection if, mm. if something that's this long is just nothing but thread and profanity. Yeah. That's very uh, mm. That's it, well, guys, thank you so much. Um, this has been really extraordinary. <laughs> thank you. Any last words? Any parting <laughs> shots? Words of wisdom? I want to, for me, I want to again thank. You, Kathleen, Matetti, and everyone for having me here. Um, it has been a difficult year for me because I was in a near fatal car accident in February, you know, healing and things like that. I was blessed and lucky that my sister Natasha, Sue Ann Peterson, and um, Sarah Fine Wilson, and my co workers at my job at Lane Sudbury were there for me because if it wasn't for that, I don't know if many of them have been ready. Mm. So I got to give thanks to those folks. They have been through this. We're so happy to have you here. Do, do any of you have any words to artists who may be disparaged, a little depressed, especially <laughs> coming out of this multiple pandemic alert? What would you tell to those of us who may be like, ah, art is not really <clears throat> valued, there's no need of exploring this thing? I always said to my students, shut up and draw. <laughs> <laughs> For me, 
even when I was in the hospital in February and couldn't even get out of bed and was struggling, I received so many sketchbooks in addition mm -hmm. to underwear, socks, and stuff <laughs> that people sent me. The essentials. Plants, the essentials. Yeah, yeah, the essentials. Every time there was a conversation with a doctor or nurse, I was like, I'd like a copy of the prescription meds and the, uh, the x-rays. And they look at me like, why? I'm like, oh, because I'm going to make a picture. I just need some scissors and some glue. I'm going to do some stuff. Keep busy no matter what. Yeah. This yeah. pandemic is going to be a part of American history, just like the Spanish time. flu. Mm. Write about your observations. Create something about your observations or your experiences. No matter what, if, when they say it, it's devalued, and I've had feelings like that. I'm not going to sit up here and lie. I have felt devalued myself. When it's like, is it even worth it? Mm. Do it anyways, because you don't know. I mean, at the very least, I feel good. I don't want to speak to you two, but I would think you feel good just doing it. You know what I'm saying? So to say, I don't want to do it because it's not going to work anything, no one's going to care. Mm -hmm. Do it because it makes you feel good. It makes you feel important inside. And that's how I treat it. Yeah. The shows, <laughs> the galleries, it'll come. But I'm not going to stop doing it because my self-esteem is so bad. It's like, there's a lot of things going on in this world. It's up to the artist to reflect it and show mm -hmm. it and hold that mirror out of people to see it. Yeah. And that's an artist's service, right? Mm -hmm. So not artist's commodity. Right, yes, I think right. that a lot of young artists make that mistake and think, you know, until I sell the work or have a show, do the work, right? Mm -hmm. And I think the rest of it follows. Yes. And because we are providing a crucial, vital, essential service uh, during these times. Oh, being, being, being your authentic self and how you and how you relate to the world, it's it's almost not a choice. You know, no matter what you're experiencing, it, that's that's all part of it. It's a way of it's a way of living and a way of relating to life and an obligation, you know, to yourself um, in expressing in expressing that your your authentic self and all those things we talked about, you know, all those influences in the world are trying to pull pull that away, you know. Mm -hmm. And it's not always a joyful, you know, it's, it can be, but it you know it can it's going with all of it. You know? That's right. That's right. Well, thank you all for coming yeah. out. Thank you. Uh, it's great to fill this uh, room with, uh, with people and beautiful artwork. John's paintings were over here. Uh, Peggy didn't bring her tap shoes, but you know, the scrolls. <laughs> <laughs> but she was known for her shop kicks. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, good chance.